I invite you to open your Bible to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first of our gospel stories, our little biographies of Jesus in the Bible. And uh, I want to start out by just introducing what we're talking about in December. Have you ever stopped to consider how strange everything about the birth of Jesus was? How unusual uh, whatever people imagined the coming of the Messiah would be like from all those prophecies in the Old Testament, it didn't fit at all with the Jesus who came. Uh, in all that he reveals to us, God reveals to us about that strange first Christmas, God is saying some important things to us. How He wants us to view just the perplexing, confusing, hurt, frustrating, fearful, unexpected, disappointing, even tragic experiences of our life. Uh, there are a lot of things God does that we don't understand why he does it the way he does or how he does it. No one understood all that was going on as Jesus Christ, Son of God, came into this world no one really understood the big picture except for God. And, and that's good because God is good. And what we want to do is we want to learn to share the heart of God that is different than uh, the heart of someone who doesn't know God, doesn't follow God. So that's why we're calling this series White Elephant Christmas. Jesus is the, the gift to the world, we say, that when we say, and here it is, this biblical package of this is Jesus and the world says like you may have said at different times and you've received unusual gifts thanks because this isn't a cartoonish Jesus this isn't a made up Jesus this isn't some kind of culturally modified Jesus it's the one in the Bible and that Jesus a lost world didn't quite get that Jesus now you think about this he wasn't what the Jews were expecting or hoping for he certainly wasn't what the the Gentile world the Romans were expecting he came from an insignificant family wrong side of the tracks welcomed into the world by shepherds and wise men by, by, by peasants and pagans it's, it's uh, in so many ways like uh, the Christmases when you know as a kid you're wanting a new bicycle and you got underwear and socks instead that's that's how it feels when we talk about the real Jesus in a white elephant Christmas Jesus came as the greatest of gifts to our world and to our lives but the gift he brings the things he called us to be and called us to do and the purpose for which he saves us the things he wants us to pursue in that, it's, it's not what in our list of, this is what I really want God to do. It's not the list of things that typically we would ask for, we want, or that we, we expect. That's why some people are disappointed with Jesus because he is different than a magic genie, than a benevolent grandfather in the sky who gives you whatever you want. Look at the context of this passage in, in Matthew. And as we look at this, Jesus shares, and we're in, we're in uh, chapter 20. As we look at this, Jesus shares a parable at the beginning of the chapter about God's grace and God's generosity. How God does things. God's grace, his generosity. And despite hearing Jesus say uh, at least twice by, at this point, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. Jesus' disciples are still missing the point. And then Jesus tells them what he has already said at other times as this dr steady drumbeat that leads to the cross continues to resonate. Jesus says in verse 18 of Matthew 20, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised. Jesus said, this is why I came. 
This is why I'm here. Now, it didn't really fit in with what they thought. The passage here, parallel passage in Mark, we see the disciples' response. They say, okay, whatever that's about. Anyway, back to us. Back to what we want, back to what we like, back to how we want the world to work. And that is, Jesus, here's what we want from you. And here's what we want you to do for us. And have you ever, ever approached God that way? God, has, his word is filled with, these are my expectations of how you have having a relationship with me. And instead you say, well, God, here are my expectations of how you ought to do it. I know you, you put all this in here, but here's what I want. Here's how I want the relationship to work. And I'm telling you, it's not not just like a big sweeping rejection of God. I see plenty of times in my life when I want it to work this way because that's the way it would be easiest for me. That's the way it would be the smooth path for me. But God sometimes does things in ways. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Verse 20. And this is coming off of, I'm, I'm going up to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified. On the third day I'll be raised they just sort of brush that aside. And he says this multiple times in the Gospels. Almost every time they brush it aside. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, this is James and John, approached him with her sons. You know, if mama can't convince Jesus, then there's no convincing. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want, he asked her. Promise, she said to him. You ever pin somebody to the wall with that you promise me what I'm about to ask for that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom Jesus answered you don't know what you're asking are you able he's not talking to her anymore he's talking to the boys who put her up to it are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink we are able they said to him he told them you will indeed drink my cup but to sit on my right and my left is not mine to give. Instead, it's for those for whom it's been prepared by my Father. Okay, now they ask big. Jesus is, and I swatted him on the nose of the newspaper. Then the ten disciples heard this, and they became indignant with the two brothers. So now the rest of them thought, well, man, you guys are jerks. Well, I sure do wish we had asked first. Jesus called them over and said, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, to, uh, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, we're going to work our way through those verses in a moment, but I want to touch on this. There have been a lot of articles recently uh, in uh, secular literature and in uh, Bible-based uh, literature and writing that's out there. A lot of articles on the rise of depression in America and its epidemic. The LA Times uh, had an article called Studies Find Depression Epidemic in Young Adults. Here's what it says. The rate of mental depression in the United States has risen dramatically over the past 30 years. People born in the last 30 years face three to 10 times the risk of major depression than their grandparents did. Now, why is that? The epidemic of depression, uh, according to their research, is traced to uh, historical and cultural occurrences that have exalted the individual. And that's a, that's a dramatic cultural, sociological change in how we do life. Depression, is, they said, is the result of a generation that their parents have taught them this. It's not, didn't just, they didn't just make it up. It came from their own families. What is best for me? It's all about me. Yeah, I don't care about anybody else. I have to think about me, my image, how I look, my goals, my dreams, my desires. And so pride and selfishness, according to their research, are the key contributors to an inclination toward depression. It's still, there's some, a lot, plenty, there are obviously plenty of factors that factor into clinical depression. Or just day-to-day uh, -day discouragement that weighs us down. But he calls this spirit an exalted entity whose pleasures and pains, successes and failures occupy center stage. That 
this is, this is more than a younger generation. This is a lot of people that whatever I'm feeling, I'm just consumed with me. And a lot of people are just consumed with themselves. And the more you think about yourself and think about yourself and think about yourself, the darker and darker and darker things become. Uh, I remember hearing this years ago, a guy said, a man wrapped, all wrapped up in himself is a very small package. Where can one turn for, this is back to the article, where can one turn for identity, satisfaction, hope? Well, to a very small and frail unit indeed, yourself. That's rough. When I live only for me, I'm asking for discouragement and depression in my life. Now, another article, uh, this from Psychology Today, uh, the article was called Beyond Selfishness. And it was on doing good, helping others, investing beyond yourself, more of that servant attitude Jesus talks about in a secular uh, source. And it talks about the more you help other people, the more it lifts you out of yourself, and the more your depression can dissipate. He said it even creates uh, hormones in your brain that give you kind of a, a high. It said... Uh, one of the articles was called Helper's High, and that was the whole uh, purpose of the article. And it said, volunteering to help people makes people feel good physically and emotionally like a runner's calm. It's good for your health. Okay, well, way to go, psychology today. What they were saying is the same thing that Paul told the Philippians 2,000 years ago. We're always trying to catch up with God's word. Philippians 2 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of the others. The idea is if I can get my, my focus off of me, off of mine, off of my desires, my hurts, my wants, my deficits, and focus on what other people need, I'm just going to be a healthier person. Uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking about yourself less. You, you don't just think about yourself because you're focusing on what you can do for other people, and the result is a happier life and a load lifted. Our model for, for this, of course, is as with all things that are good and right, is Jesus. Because he's so unselfish and so giving, sacrificial. Matthew twenty twenty eight. 28 the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's what makes this a good Christmas passage. Because there are multiple places in the Bible where it said, here's why Jesus came. Now, a lot of times we can find the Christmas story to the first couple of chapters of Matthew, the first couple of chapters of Luke. But the Christmas story is scattered throughout. Why did Jesus come? Why has Jesus, why did Jesus enter this world and he came to serve others, he says here. He came to demonstrate what an unselfish life looked like. He came to show a life that is lived in an extravagant way of generosity. He gave himself away, and he calls us to follow his example. Now, I know that I can throw that out there, and here's what we can all say. I should do that. That is not the same thing as doing that, by the way. Just in case you weren't sure about how obedience to God works. And you say, oh yeah, I should be unselfish. Hey, thanks for that, Chad. Boy, I'm glad I came to church. Thanks for the new word from the Lord. Well, you know what? The reason these things, by the way, the reason Jesus said these things multiple times is because those guys weren't listening. And I recognize that many of you are not listening. I, I'm not oblivious to sitting in a pew. I did it for much of my life. I still do from time to time. Therefore, it's a matter of what are you going to do about that? What action are you going to take? What's going to be different going out from today? Now, here's the thing about that life, though. And I feel it, man. I feel it. This is personal for me. It goes against our bent. It goes against our basic human inclination because ultimately, we're really all about ourselves. And self-preservation and self-aggrandizement. Uh, it's me and what I want, what I like. Selfishness is who we are naturally. That's, that's just where, where the road goes if you, if, you let, if you let your life go any way you'd like. 
It is not, being, being unselfish is not the gift we would normally request or desire. Uh, we would not be a generous people. It is not how we're wired. Our typical American culture is an individualistic culture. In a biblical worldview is about community and relationships and loving our neighbor as ourselves and deepening our sense of, of church family and gr- small group and community and with our families. The word community is a word we use a lot now. I think it just gave a freshness to the word that a lot of us grew up saying, which was fellowship. The word fellowship in the Bible is a Greek word. Greek word, you've, many of you have been in church for any length of time, that quantania word. And it's an important word, and it's translated in a lot of different ways in the Bible. Uh, because it's like a diamond, multifaceted, and you catch different views of it, and it's interpreted in different ways, translated in different ways, in different contexts. So in, just in the Bible, that word quantania, fellowship, but also community, participation, contribution, and generosity, because that is core to fellowship relationship. Paul wrote, be generous and willing to share and that's capturing that word quantania, one word, quantania. And you, you can't have community without generosity. You can't have relationships that are healthy in family, in, in church, and community without generosity. I have long loved this quote from Carl Menninger, the famous psychiatrist, founder of the uh, Menninger Psychiatric Clinic. He, said, he wrote this years and years ago. Generosity is one of the most essential components of mental health. In their research, he says, we have found that generous people are rarely mentally ill. So, in the interest of the mental health of the people sitting on either side of you today, we're going to look at how to be more generous with each other. And and there's some incredible benefits in my life when I accept this gift that I am not inclined to ask for, want, expect. But it really is true. The words of Jesus The Bible says, remember the words of the Lord Jesus in Acts 20. Jesus, because he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that's a hard sell if I'd thrown it down in the children's sermon. It's a hard sell for a bunch of adults too. What are the blessings that come with a generous heart? Three quick things. Here we go. A generous heart creates community. It doesn't just contribute to it. It creates it and it can't exist without generosity. Paul tells us, For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. When we're generous to each other, really it focuses our hearts on the Lord. It's not just, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You you gave me something for Christmas. I, I gave you something for Christmas. Now we're thankful for each other. But generosity creates a thanks to the Lord. We're drawn closer to one another when we are generous as givers. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So in other words, wherever I put my treasure, you know what my treasures are? Now there's financial treasure, resources. There's a lot of time and energy resource in my life too. And in that treasure, where I put it, directs my heart. And this is an important principle of the Bible, that giving points your heart in a direction. Uh, being generous with your time, your talent, your, your resources, it directs your heart. And it's not hard to figure out where, where is that going, and you'll find that's what you're passionate about. That's where, that's where you go in your time of need. That's what you love. And there are a lot of different things that, that draw that out of us. And not hard to come up with a list. Uh, but if you want to have a heart for Microsoft... A great way to have a heart for Microsoft is to invest in their stock. Then suddenly, Microsoft, which you just thought was an irritation on your day-to-day inter- interactions with it, suddenly you're really passionate about Microsoft. You have a heart. You start praying for Microsoft because your heart is directed by how your resources flow. It's true for a lot of things. Wherever I put my time and money, that's where my heart is. Now. There are a lot of different places that goes. But you can track this. If it's investing in your kids' activities and whatever they're doing with your time and your resources, that becomes where your heart goes. And 
awesome. Uh, if it's a lot of energy in your resources is going toward work and it, be- it can become all consuming, that's where your heart goes to. That's, that's what you're passionate about. That's what's always on your mind. Everything else is a distraction or uh, is something lesser in your life. A favorite hobby. Oh, there are all kinds of things that capture this. But what happens is those things where, where, your, where your resources go, your time, your energy, your financial resources, where those things go is where your heart is. And uh, God can get squeezed out of that when the things of God aren't a part of that flow of who you are. We see it all the time. Wherever your treasure is, your heart will be there. So here's the thing, anytime I am generous with you, I am generous with the under-resourced, the poor, I am generous with God, that's where my heart tends to go. And I found uh, my heart directed clearly by those things, those investments of uh, me. Every time I give to God, it draws my heart closer to God. Every time I give to you, it draws my heart closer to you. Giving, generosity, then creates this community where we really love each other because we are generous with each other. Uh, you look at James and John, they were selfish. And then when they were selfish, it was contagious. Selfish is always contagious. Then the other disciples are also selfish. They're about their agenda instead of Jesus' agenda. And what happens? You're not generous with each other. Time, talent, treasure. Community starts to break down. Relationships don't work right. Selfishness erodes love for one another but in generosity we turn the tables the second thing a generous heart defeats materialism the more generous I am the more it defeats selfishness in my life would you agree that we live in a selfish culture a materialistic culture now we just coming off of Black Friday and all the things that go with uh, kicking off the Christmas season man we feel the materialism of it surely you do you feel the 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 magnetic draw of this so I went looking for this most inf- this is uh, about a year and a half old now but I went looking Collin County most of us uh, live in Collin County here in the room uh, where our motto is Collin County you go to the Collin County website it says can uh, get all you can can on you get sit on the can that's the that's the motto of Collin County I can't prove that, (laughs) but I do believe it. So here's the research I found. Despite Collin County's general affluence, because it's one of the wealthiest counties in the country across the board, there are plenty of under-resourced and people who are struggling, but uh, across the board generally, a lot of affluence in our county. We have general affluence, high levels of employment, and on time secondary school graduation. So a lot of big positives and about the county, but there's one area where we do not perform well. Charitable giving as a proportion of income. And this is fascinating to me. The residents in Collin County give just uh, 2.94% of uh, income to charitable giving. So just under 3%. By the way, that is less than every neighboring county around us. And it is lower than the state average of 3.59%. We're one of the the most stingy counties in the world. Now here's what else messes that up. Is we're that low, but if you take out all the tithing, given a, like the Bible says, give a tenth of your income to to your local church and then grace giving beyond that you take those people out and that charitable giving number drops into 1% uh, range and that is uh, pretty typical I'm going to those of you who are guests or you're new to our church let me tell you something uh, about this place you came driving onto a parking lot uh, walked into buildings here and somebody paid for everything that's here. But there's a confusion about that. Some people think, well, you know, probably denomination paid for it or some grant paid for it. You know what? That is just never the case in a Baptist church. 
denomination doesn't contribute anything to, uh, to a congregation. We contribute to them for things we do in partnership with other churches in our denomination, but they don't contribute anything to us. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have any grant money. The reason all these things are here is because there are people sitting around you who live a life of generosity. They're unselfish. And this didn't just happen. It happened because people gave sacrificially. Uh, I, I, we've got a lot of investment in brick and mortar, a lot of investment in uh, properties, a lot of investment in the things that enable us to do the things we do. Because, see, that's not the beginning and end of what we do. Because you, you look at the list of things that happen in this church, and all the things of caring for our community through our food pantry on an ongoing basis, all the Thanksgiving baskets that went out to families in need uh, this uh, last month, and then all the folks that are represented in that angel tree out there, that we have more uh, angels on the angel tree, uh, folks who have needs than ever before, because there's a lot of need that we've identified. And, I'm telling you, I, we want to encourage you, be a part of that kind of stuff. But we're doing all these things all the time. We're doing missions around the world. We have a team of three in one of the most unreached places in the world uh, this next week uh, who, are, who are training believers to share the gospel and uh, to, to make disciples. We do that kind of stuff all year long. You know, we gave away close to a half million dollars in our church to ministry beyond our walls it has nothing to do with what we do week to week here it's the beyond here people who not not just looking after our people but it's way beyond here there's so many different opportunities we give to missions with the Lottie, our Lottie Moon offering and we're, we focus on that all through the month of December and that's just in addition to our ongoing ministries of caring for people reaching people sharing the gospel with people and it's really amazing compared to our culture because if we look at our county and we look at our nation, uh, we are an oasis of generosity in a really selfish place. And by this they'll know you're my disciples if you love one another and if you're, uh, you're generous people for sure. So Jesus calls out James and John because they want a position. They want power. They want all the... the uh, the benefit package that goes with those things. And Jesus goes on to challenge them. And uh, how, the way he says it's awesome. He says, hey, if I want that, if I want that selfish, self-centered kind of life, I can get that from the pagan world. I can get that from people who don't even care about me or care about the things of God. That's how they do things, all about themselves. They aren't interested uh, when they're not on the receiving end of the blessings, the service, the grace, the generosity. And Jesus just says, don't be like those guys. Don't be like a secular world that is locked down in selfishness. Listen, the antidote to materialism, we see this time of year, the selfishness that drives it is generosity. And every time you are generous with your time, your talent, your resources, you just win a spiritual victory in your heart. And every time you are generous, your, your heart grows instead of shrinking up and becoming more self-centered. Every time you're generous, you break the grip of materialism in your life, which is so ma such a powerful magnetic force in this part of the world. There's always somebody that has more than I do, and I want to have what they have. Because selfishness is all about getting. You ever get this from your kids? Uh, that selfishness, and you say, my goodness, they're always wanting more, and they're always asking for more. Why is that? Because you taught them that. That's why. Because they saw you being self-centered and you being materialistic. And that's where the kids learn it. And that's why they're the way they are. And God says every time you share with a friend, share with your family, share with a neighbor, anytime you're generous with anybody, you break the grip and defeating the selfishness in your life. And, and I'll say this as a parent. To you parents, we saw this in our own children uh, as a great benefit and continue to do these things with your young adult children as they see it from us include your children in the process of being generous there's a lot of, you may be wonderfully generous you know and you're you're giving uh, online you have it all set up there you you and, and you guys are wonderful about that uh 
you're doing all this stuff that's gloriously generous, invite your kids into that. Let's do this together as a family. When, when your children at whatever age, just see, see your heart. It has such a tremendous influence on them. Uh, include them in what you're doing and how you're doing it and how you pray about it and how you, uh, how you seek to bless beyond yourself. The third thing is that a generous heart is an investment for eternity. Generosity is an investment. Jesus said, don't store, this is a Sermon on the Mount, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why did Jesus come? Our example of generous living, well, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He paid our debt for sin at the cross that we might spend eternity in heaven with him. I don't know what you're investing in, but how long range are your investments? Rhonda and I have investments. Uh, what are you investing in? Time, talent, treasure. And God says, live an unselfish, generous life and touch other lives for time and for eternity. How about that? Now, you've heard it said, you can't take it with you. There's a, and it's actually a staged picture that shows up from time to time of a, of a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. Uh, well, you know what? That's just not how it works. As much as you like that, you can't take it with you. Did you know funeral homes uh, make available burial suits? Like you don't have a suit to bury your loved one in, they'll make one available. And you can get them, they're less expensive than you know, going down to your local department store and buying a suit because they're more cheaply made because they don't require pockets. You can make a suit much uh, less expensively if it doesn't have pockets. Burial suits don't have pockets. You can't take it with you. But you can send it on ahead of you during your life on this earth. And how do you do that? By investing in other people going to heaven. Uh, through your love, through your energy, through your effort, through your testimony, through giving to make sure that the gospel's going to the ends of the earth. Every time you're generous with the poor, with a friend, with a neighbor, with, with God, anytime you're generous with your time, your money, your effort, God says, you're storing up a, for an investment in a bank in heaven. Now, your time on earth is uh, whatever it's going to be. And uh, we don't know what that's going to be. A lot of us have said goodbye to people we love this year. And uh, maybe it's 80 years. Maybe 100 years. Maybe uh, medical developments will make it so that we're living 110, 120 years. But you're going to spend trillions and trillions eternity years in heaven so where do you need to have your biggest account and your most intentional investment where are you going to spend the most time so how do you store up treasure in heaven well Jesus said it this way uh, and through the word this is first Timothy 6 it says tell the rich now I love a verse that starts like that Paul's telling Timothy, tell the rich, and all of us go, yeah, I know who he's talking about, not me. Whatever we're making, not me, it's somebody besides me. Well, I tell you, if you're sitting in the pew here, you live in Collin County, you live in the United States of America, even with tremendous financial problems and difficulties, you're going you're gonna to grade out as some of the richest people in the world. I have a website for you. You might jot this down. Don't start looking at it yet. I'm not quite done. Globalrichlist.com. What you do is you just, it just has a thing to type in. Here's my income. And I do this periodically. Here's my income. And here's where I grade out. You're going to be in the top 1% in the world if you live in these United States of America. You're going to immediately drop the top 1% in the whole world richest people now Jesus says or no this is not Jesus this is Paul here it is here's the full passage instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant he's talking about us or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth 
but on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. Storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the coming age so they may take hold of what is truly life. It's really the only safe investment for eternity. And in doing that, you'll be living a fruitful, blessed, blessed life just now. There's no greater investment than the kingdom of God. And when you help other people with your time and your energies, and your resources, and you're sharing the gospel that Jesus came to save us from our sin, because that's why he came, that's the Christmas story's reason, that's an investment that is protected by a whole lot more than the FDIC or whatever other to- tools you want to use, protected by heaven. By the way, uh, Ross is uh, Ross Ramsey's out uh, with a mission with this mission team, small mission team. He and John Wooldridge and uh, Vince Vo uh, in a faraway place, and he asked if I would uh, if I'd uh, carry things forward in outreach this afternoon. I want to challenge you. Some of you haven't been out in a while. Four o'clock today, over in Building E, we're just going to go out into the community and we're going to do some. We'll pray for people and we'll seek to share the gospel. We'll put you with someone who's experienced and been, you know, maybe you feel rusty in those tools that you were trained in. Uh, I want to encourage you, come out with us and we'll put you with somebody so you, you don't even have to talk if you don't want to. But we're going to do some inviting too because there are a lot of people that are open to an invite this time of year. And we're going to see what God's at work. So come join me at 4 o'clock. Now, There's another word for generous in the Bible, and it's the word gracious. Gracious. God shows his grace by being generous to you. And there are lots of examples of how blessing generously blesses me in return. Deuteronomy 15 has one. God's talking about serving him by serving the needs of the poor. And he says, give to him and don't have a stingy heart when you give. And because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you do. On this uh, first Sunday, December, God's white elephant gift to you is the call to give your life generously to him who gave his life for you. And uh, is that really a gift that you want? Well, there are a couple of things about that passage, uh, Deuteronomy 15. You might circle back on that one, and on Deuteronomy 15, circle all and everything that's a couple of key words how many of you would like that to happen bless you in all your work and in everything you do that's a pretty big sweep of blessing and how does that happen to live a generous life become a generous person and here's the question always a question when we finish up what the bible says do you really believe that's true And what you do next tells the true story of what you really believe. What you do with what the Bible says, not what you know about what the Bible says, but what you do about what the Bible says determines what you really believe. And maybe in your mind, you've already cut those verses out of your Bible because of the inconvenient truth nature of them. Because that's not the gift I want. That's that's just a white elephant gift uh, Foolishness, got to be a joke from God. Listen, a lot of the people around you can give testimony. Rhonda and I can give you a lot of testimony that being generous with time, with our talents, and with the resources God has entrusted to us has been a source of tremendous blessing. And it really directs our hearts. It changes how we, uh, how we do community it sets our minds toward eternity. And it'll do the same thing in your life. And I want to encourage you. Be generous. Generous.